Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, and we should go to the next presentation. Our new presenter uh, will be Keith Walker from University of uh, Liverpool. Uh, he uh, was uh, has have been a teacher uh, in Welsh schools and uh, colleges uh, for over 25 years. And now uh, he is teaching in a further education college in North Wales. He recently finished his PhD uh, research examining contemporary classroom boredom as a social historically situated subjective uh, in secondary school education in the UK. So uh, the uh, floor is yours. So I'm very interested in your PhD study and this presentation. So I, I uh, hoping for a glance at your research. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. First thing I'd like to just ap apologize about yesterday. I couldn't make it. I, I got stuck in the exam boards all day and it was a nightmare. Um, and I was <laughs> gutted I missed yesterday. So apologies about that. Uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of today though. Um, okay. So um, I'll have to uh, click on the present button. Where is it? There it is. There we go. Right. So, okay. So um, I've got a, a, a thingy there. So I'll just get rid of that. There we go. Fantastic. Okay, so um, my uh, research. So we leave it on that that, that uh, slide for a minute. So my research uh, was uh, I was I was interested in boredom as what I termed an ethno emotion. Um, so I've read kind of uh, of stuff that I think we're all familiar with. There's some of the psychology and some of the sociology and some of the history and the literature and stuff surrounding boredom. But one of the thing, things I thought that was missing from the study of boredom was from a child's point of view, a school pu pupil's point of view, like how does boredom work? So it's like an ethno psychology, if you like. So from an everyday person's point of view, what is the psychology of boredom? How does boredom work? How does it feel? Um, what, what are the causes of it? Uh, what are the effects of it? But not from a sort of informed psychological or sociological perspective, but from the, the, from the participants themselves. So the mechanics of boredom from a child's point of view. Uh, so do they feel that boredom is largely situational? Do they feel it's that boredom is dispositional? Um, or do they feel it's linked to time? Or do they feel that it's linked to activities? That's the sort of thing I, I was interested in doing with this, uh, with the research, um, to, to sort of show how boredom is constructed uh, uh, from a child's point of view. Um, and that in a way of, of or can we just go back again? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, OK, so looking at how, what and and, and why. Um, but the other thing that my research was all about, what, what the other thing I'm interested in was was also language and the role of language in the constructing of uh, the, the construction of boredom and how children use language. Um, intersubjectively and how children talk about boredom themselves and in particular how children can uh, construct and, and, and build an activity and begin to create a knowledge of an activity as as boring amongst themselves so we can go on to the next slide that's fantastic so firstly i'm going to quickly whiz through my methodology which was a focus group methodology and then look at some findings uh to date okay so we on the next slide. OK, so uh, focus group was the thing that I, I kind of used as my research method because I was interested in, in children talking together. Ideally, I would like just a naturally occurring conversation that would happen about boredom. But I just the, I just couldn't work out a way of doing that. So I kind of created a conversation, if you like, uh, concerning boredom. And I got uh, children together to and I, and I kind of tried a number of methods to try and, and facilitate uh, encouraging the children to, to, to have a conversation about uh, boredom. Can go to the next slide. However, it is worth sort of remembering that my the conversations that I elicited and I created, I did create them. So I encouraged the students to talk about boredom and I, uh, I sort of so the conversation is a kind of artificially created conversation. I would have loved just to have been able to ease off, drop on a naturally occurring conversation about boredom. But it was just logistically, it was just an impossibility. Um, 
there was at one point we've we've got a a, a laboratory in a, a psychology a psychology lab in 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 the col in the university and i was going to try and wire that up with loads of microphones and get children to come in but the data i would have produced for probably a snippet of boredom conversation would have been ridiculous so i opted to create uh some conversations so go into the next slide my pilot study was an absolute disaster <laughs> um in my pilot study um i i got the children to rank the most boring 10 things for one is the most boring 10 to the least boring as um to elicit a conversation so the idea was i directed them to do that and they sat in groups of three or four and they had a conversation about boredom the trouble with this method was that the method itself was so controlled they got so obsessed with the method they just forgot to talk about boredom and they were just talking about ranking and numbers and things like that so it was a complete disaster but so i put that in there first because it, it it didn't go well the first time i kind of did it i ran this over a, just before a summer a few years ago and it and it just didn't didn't work and so i racked my brain can we go to the next slide and this is the thing i ended up using this is the actual method i used in the end it was kind of structured enough to get them to talk about boredom, but not too structured that they got too distracted. So I got uh, very small uh, focus groups. There were three or five, three to five participants in each. They were all between the ages of 14 to 17. Uh, they were taken from three secondary schools all together. They were in this first wave. There was actually another wave after this. There were 37 participants in this first wave. And what I, I, after I'd gone through ethics and that sort of stuff, I sat them in a room on their own and I gave them this board and no other instructions. And I just said, and I gave one of them a recorder and just said, press play, a uh, record, sorry. And then when you've done, press stop and then come out. And I left and I just left them in the room with this. And most of them, it took about half an hour before they left the room. They, it, it kind of took about half an hour for them to talk about it. And so there was no direction from me beyond this. So it and, and it and it seemed to work because it seemed to prompt them to have a conversation, but one one that was little had little um, um, control. And so, what I wanted to do then with the with the um, with the transcripts, I had the the recordings and I turned them all into transcripts. Was then to try and analyze their talk to see if there was you know to see if I could understand how these children considered boredom working what was the mechanics of boredom that was one of the things i was interested in um but a number of things you know as often the case with qualitative research a number of things popped out that were completely un unexpected so we can go on to the go on to the next slide there we go and one of the things that popped out that this didn't actually go into my phd because there was just not enough room to put everything in so I'm kind of thinking about putting this together as a, as a paper. So um, I'm sort of presenting it today as a forerunner of that. And so all, all comments will be welcome about it. And one of the things that I noticed within the conversations that the children had was the way in which they managed accusations of boring against teachers. So in order for a, a, a children to collectively to gather together the enough information to accuse a teacher of being boring they had to go through certain processes and there was a certain constructive kind of process that occurred for children to make a successful accusation of a teacher as being uh, boring and if uh, and if a number of those a number of elements were included then the accusation fell apart and and the lesson couldn't be knowable as boredom and the teacher was 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 saved from that accusation <clears throat> so we can click on to the next slide please okay <clears throat> so when i was reading through the transcripts i noticed that just there was a sort of process that occurred before teachers were accused of being boring and it reminded me very much of something I'd read from uh, Silverman, who uh, had done conversation analysis, which is the uh, it's like a, a branch of ethno methodology where it looks at how people create realities and how people construct realities. Uh, and Silverman had done some research with um, patients who had been found positive of having HIV. So he had done some research on how the counsellors and the patients 
managed that diagnosis and in particular the counsellor after the the diagnosis had to ask questions very delicate questions about the person's sex life and so uh, Silverman studied that and he noticed that in order for the counsellors to, to, to get to these delicate issues there were certain things that were always identified within the the text and this is uh, the first one is called a prospective display sequence and that's that's just sort of a gradual building up to make the act to, to, to talk about the delicate matter so rather than dive straight in the counsellors were kind of making um, uh, we're, we're sort of working slowly towards it. Um, uncertain knowledge markers uh, are utterances such as I don't know, I think, maybe, it could be, sometimes, those sorts of things. They were quite littered within the conversation. Uh, perturbations are things like um, uh, uh, ah, uh, just sort of utterances like that. Hyperbole, massive exaggerations that were treated as, as, as uh, true. And the last one is cooperatively achieved. And this is really important for me as well, um, which that there has to be a working together between the counsellor and the patient in order for them to collectively um, reach the point at which they would uh, arrive at the delicate uh, matter. And this was the thing that kind of really triggered um, for me because I kind of noticed that the children in the conversations, they kind of had to work together in order to construct an accusation of board, boredom, boredom against um, a teacher. And I've got a, a couple of extracts for that, one uh, big extract. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so this is, uh, this is in three sections. This is all one extract of dialogue, but it's, uh, it's in three uh, sections. So the, the, the numbers refer to uh, periods of time, one and a half seconds, three seconds, one and a half seconds. So each of those seconds generally is a sign of a perturbation. It's generally recognised within conversation analysis as, as an indication of possible trouble within, within speech. So the first uh, question here, we've got female one. There's uh, female one, male one and male two um, in, in this um, uh, interview. And they're kind of talking amongst each other because I'm not in the room when this is happening. So female one says, um, when do people get bored? It's a very general kind of very general question. Now, the first answer to that, again, is in class. Very general, no accusations. It's in class. It's very, very mild. Um, M2 just laughs at that, that answer, indicating, again, it's a perturbation. There's some kind of uncomfortable thing there but nothing too serious going on F f1 responds with another laugh and then she says people people get bored again very general people get bored in class very general at, at this stage this is the first level nothing's really been accused and it's all very general can we move on to the next slide second this is all the same conversation this is line six now, M2 introduces teacher straight away, when your teacher's just like. And then and then what does when there's no, when there's no. So she's sort of joining in and M2 says, does that talking go all the time? M1, F1 jo jumps in jo and, and joins in and they're talk and talk and telling you to write down. And they're saying and they're saying they're talking too quickly. And the talking too quickly bit was said really, really fast. That's what the little indication is for. M1 joins in with a yeah, and F1 and F1 the female joins in a little bit more, and he, he, and you can't you can't write anything down. And M2 yeah, it's like too overwhelming to write, so you just don't. So at the moment we've got F1 and M2 uh, who are both kind of working together on this accusation, which now we've got the teacher accused. They've joined in on that, and it's to do with talking and writing is the accusation, and they're both joining in on it, okay? Uh, M1 is making sort of positive notions. He's not contradicting anything. He's going, yeah, mm, yeah, uh-huh. And M1 is, and then you get bored. So at the mo in this slide, we've got M1, M2, and F1 all joining in with the accusation. Can we have uh, the next slide? Okay, and then it builds up the accusation. 
F1, uh, who, K. K was the name of one of the uh, participants, okay? Um, and then it starts, it depends on what activity you do. And at this, this point, they're all joining in. They're all loving this accusation. They're all loving it that they're having a go at the teacher. And uh, like, as you can see, line 20, they just all erupt with laughter. What the teacher is, you know, the fact that they're mentioned and they're accusing the teacher, they absolutely love it. And they uh, really start laughing and packing up. And that happened a lot with these with these interviews. As soon as they became sort of, they freed themselves to talk about teachers and have a go at teachers, they absolutely loved it. And they just started uh, absolutely uh, greasing up with laughter. Uh, F, F, F1, uh, line 23. Uh, a lot of my people in my form, so she generalises it, people, quite a few of them, get bored with pretty much all the teachers. So now we're going into all the teachers. And it's still going on to be fair. And then 26 goes, yeah, they are all boring. And then 27 is line 27. M2 says, who bores me? Teachers. And he really shouts that loud. And everybody laughs. And that's remarkable development in what was a very few seconds of uh, conversation. From the very for the the initial answer was uh, people get bored in class, but now because they've worked together, in in about three or four seconds of dialogue, they've worked together to create this accusation that teachers are the main problem in schools, and they've created that together. Okay. Now then, one of the things that's important as well as seeing uh, and this that that kind of accusation or that format act happened time and time and time again but there were many times when uh the accusations of boredom absolutely failed and, and it, they couldn't be constructed and these are all known as within conversation analysis these are all known as deviant cases and what deviant cases can I have the next slide as well please and what deviant cases are really useful for is they can kind of show you what is missing okay so why did this didn't you know this is a situation where an accusation failed well, why what what's missing from this accusation and one of the things that's really missing from the deviant cases in the times when children failed to be able to construct a um accusation successfully the main thing that was missing is that, 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 is that the children didn't work together to, to to make that accusation and a lone voice often just failed um, to make the accusation. So can we have the next slide? So this is an example of a failed um, accusation. So F, F3 is the person who who is, you know, wishes to make the accusation of uh, teachers are boring. Okay, so she's she's got that. Uh, she says, uh, line 135, to be honest, most times that's when you get most bored. And then, uh, then straight away she jumps in, especially it's it's not just the classwork it's the teachers pointing to the teachers now the following dialogue there m1 is incredulous in his response you get bored of the teachers f3 yes it's the teachers f2 again incredulous you're blaming the teachers f3 i'm blaming the teachers and she's having to repeat it over and over again because the other two are not joining in one of the reasons why this fails is because f3 she doesn't build up the accusation she dives in straight away that sort of perspective display sequence of a gradual allowing the accusation to emerge she doesn't do she dives straight in with the accusation of the teachers and the other two um respondents just they, they don't they don't join in they just refuse to join in she's gone in too quickly she should have built that up and then brought everyone in with her to allow that knowledge to, to develop. Um, and that accusation finishes with F2 saying, I don't know why we have just, just because you got bored in class, let's just move on. So the accusation of teachers being boring failed to occur in that, sen in, in that extract. F3 couldn't establish that within, within there because the gradualness of the prospective display sequence didn't occur. Can we have the next slide? This is a, a very short one, uh, but again, another deviant case. Uh, M1, why does boredom happen? Teachers, ha ha. 
again, he's gone in too soon. F147 uh, just goes, oh, it's natural. No agreement there with teachers. F2, because the work might be too easy or too hard. Next. Yeah, next. He just doesn't. M M1's accusation never, never doesn't stand. There's no joining in. So the accusation fails. The status of the lesson is boring. Uh, doesn't um, um, uh, doesn't manifest. Doesn't doesn't appear. Um, can I have the last slide? I think that's nearly it. Oh yes. Yeah, so the overall conclusion. Then. Um, <clears throat> there is evidence that uh, from from the, the transcripts that I took that uh, in order for children to make an accusation regarding teachers and schools and things and lessons as of being boring, then there needs to be a kind of group effort within that soul voices within the research i looked at um seem to fall down and unless children are working together there's a kind of collective sense and a collective conversation and a collective meaning making and construction making of lessons being boring those accusations seem to um uh, fall down so i'd say that to, at some level in order to understand how children be come to know a lesson as boring we have to in some way understand the way they collectively uh, make sense of uh, of their own sort of uh, experiences in lessons and stuff okay thank you very much oh and loads of references <laughs> thank you thank you very much as well for uh, for that and apologies i couldn't get the slide up thank you <clears throat> Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. We have uh, still time for some questions. Uh, do we have questions for Keith? Mm, no one? Everybody are uh, intimidating by your excellent speech. <laughs> I think one of the difference, uh, one of the, the, the differences is in that way the way I've approached boredom is that uh, it, it's very much from a, a position of um, I, I wanted to know what how children like an ethnopsychology, like how how do everyday people, how do children think boredom works? Do you see what I mean? Because it was one of those things that I think we've probably all found that on on a lay everyday um, setting, everybody knows what boredom is and everybody knows how boredom works, but it's it's us academics that struggle with it. And so that I wanted to try and unlock that. You know, it, boredom is such an unproblematic concept to most people. Um, and I thought that well, if I can lock, if I can get in, if I can lock into that certainty in some way, then uh, that would be useful. Oh. Yeah, I like uh, your uh, approach, the soci so sociological uh, constructivism. Uh, yeah. Social constructivism. Yeah. yeah, that maybe boredom is not obvious, but we create and recreate our discourses uh, and our experiences even maybe uh, about boredom. So this is not uh, straightforward. Uh, this is uh, somehow constructed uh, in social interactions. And uh, yes, Vinant have a question, please. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for your talk, Keith. Uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, uh, research. Um, I, I wonder to what extent. Uh, so, so I've been I've been doing some research on stereotypes that people have of those that they consider to be boring, um, and 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 I wonder to what extent perhaps uh, uh, what you hear these uh, kids say. Uh, reflect stereotypes that they may hold, especially of, you know, grown-ups would tend to probably to be boring in the eyes of many kids. Uh, just curious what your thoughts are. Okay. <laughs> I hope my question wasn't that unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, the, the meeting. Uh, maybe there are some technical problems. Uh, so uh, please, Vinant, maybe you uh, write down your question and uh, maybe we can uh, come back to the, the, the question uh, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Okay, so there are probably some technical issues. So we go further uh, with uh, our session and maybe there will be time for uh, following questions uh, to, to Keith. Uh, I'm very interested in, in the paper, 
uh, because there is a lot to process uh, here and uh, we uh, had uh, only a bit uh, glimpse uh, what what is all about.